So for our next session, we're going to be talking about pricing your CSA. Um, I'm really excited. Um, we have Christy Durbin and Bree Pearsall here. Um, Christy is an instructor at the University of Kentucky in the Department of Horticulture. She teaches within the Sustainable Agriculture and Community Food Systems Program. Christy has been the manager of the University of Kentucky's Community Supported Agriculture, CSA, Educational and Outreach Program at the Horticulture Research Farm since 2016. The farm provides certified organic vegetables, fruits, and herbs for over 200 households. And then Bree Pearsall is the owner and farmer of Rootbound Farm in Crestwood, Kentucky, with her husband, Ben Abel, and two children. Their 160-acre farm is certified organic, and their diversified CSA offers serves over 800 families. So we have two experts that are going to talk to us. And let me just hand it over to Christy. Thanks, Bethany. Um, I'm going to go ahead and see about sharing my screen. So give me one second. All right, we good there? That looks great. All right, so I'm just going to start off by giving you all a little bit of background um, about um, our CSA program and and then um, looking forward to Bree sharing as well. Um, so some of you may know that uh, Bree's partner, Ben Abel, was also the CSA manager originally at the UK program. So um, but anyways, I've been there um, since 2012 and managing since 2016. And so just as a little background, um, you know, we started in 2007. And it was really just education and, and extension, which has continued to be our mission. But it was only a quarter acre or thereabouts and uh, started with about 40 CSA members. And so since then, you know, we've scaled up um, and it's now operating on about 10 acres. We've dabbled in wholesale. Um, we are highly um, mechanized at this point um, for our scale. I would consider us kind of a medium size farm. We have about 10 seasonal staff or five full-time equivalent staff. Um, so that's just kind of a nice background on, on us. Now, in terms of what our CSA looks like, um, right now it's we have around 250 uh, members. Um, 240 of those are paying members. So we do offer uh, staff shares for our staff and that's part of our membership there. So 10 of those for staff. We only offer um, one share size, which we consider the kind of a regular size, that mid-range size. So we don't offer a small size or a robust larger size. And our share sizes are roughly around eight to 12 different items. Um, so members are getting about 400 pounds of produce a season, and our season is about 22 weeks. Um, and so right now our payment is $37 a week. So that is our current price. And we do um, participate in the Kentucky Farm Share um, Coalition's voucher program with UK Health and Wellness. And so the predominant uh, membership at our farm is um, CSA members who uh, are employed at UK. And so they are eligible for a $100 or $200 voucher. So they, they, also, they um, can use the $200 voucher for the regular size share that we offer. Um, and so I'd say about 75 to 85% of our CSA members are taking advantage of that voucher, which of course um, impacts the price and kind of their bottom dollar in terms of what they're paying. I will say that um, being CSA growers, we are growing probably about 40 different crops. This is predominantly vegetables, though we also grow um, annual fruits and some herbs. So that's just a little bit about what the CSA itself looks like. So when we talk about pricing, um, I really enjoyed Katie's presentation. And I think that a lot of this is going to overlap with what she had to say in the sense of marketing is a huge piece of the consideration when you are thinking about pricing. Um, knowing your customer base, knowing what their expectations are um, will add, definitely factor into that and how you can think about um, retaining your customers. So which brings us to the retention. It's kind of the uh, the big CSA issue that is kind of difficult for a lot of folks to wrap their head around. The national average being 46%, which is um, pretty sad in my in our opinion. Um, so uh, obviously we want that number to be much higher. Otherwise you have this burden as a CSA grower to continue to find new members every single year. Um, and that is difficult. So at this point um, at our program, we're hovering around that 60% retention um, that was for last year. Um, I do include in here in our statistics that um, 
we consider um, these gap years. So what I've also seen a trend in CSA is that we do have some members who are returning after a period of absence, and that might be one or two year absence, and then they come back. And so if we include those members who had some experience with our farm in the past and then return for whatever reason um, after having a gap year, it's a higher uh, retention rate, around 68%. Obviously, I think we all want those numbers to go higher. And so anything we can do about retention is good, which is why pricing really does matter. Um, when you think about that sticker price, that sticker value, you don't want to give them such a sticker shock that they're they're just running away and thinking, like, this isn't for me, right? So how do we um, make it attractive, um, but also make it worth our while as growers to um, continue to produce the CSA? So... This is kind of the big question. What is a CSA share worth? And um, why will someone choose a CSA over, say, shopping a la carte? Um, a lot of CSA growers also do farmer's markets, also do farm stands and farm sales on their farm, have farm stores, things of that nature. So if you're inviting them to join a CSA, that bigger commitment, it, it is a bigger sticker price. So how do we um, encourage them to do that? over just shopping a la carte. Um, so I do think this gets into this idea of um, tangible and intangible values. So when I think about the tangible values, that's obvious. That's what they're getting each week in their basket, their box, um, the actual food that's going on their table. But a CSA is such a unique product. And I think that we need to really emphasize that as CSA growers. Um, so it is a relationship. And so there is that intangible value of them knowing you as their farmer, um, and what does that look like for them? And how is that um, worthwhile for them and valuable to them? And can you actually put a value on that? It's really tricky. So I would say that um, someone who wants to be a CSA member needs to see the value of that relationship and what they can get out of that in the sense of that connection to the farm and their food. Um, and there also might be other things that you're providing that are beyond the contents of the share. So in addition to that relationship, Maybe you are providing recipes or you're providing a newsletter with information about your farm. Uh, maybe you're offering tours or on-farm events. Um, we do a potluck once a year at our farm. We also offer a U-Pick operation so that they can opt in for that and get a few extra good, goodies each week for whatever we have available for U-Pick. So there might be different ways that they see another value to it beyond just their weekly share, their weekly box. But I do think when you think about the value, you can obviously get some benchmarks from the market value. So one thing that I do pay attention to um, is the projections that I make for the CSA. So every year I'm planning what I want to go in that box each week, what I want our members to get. I'm projecting out um, what they should be receiving. I don't always, um, I'm not always able to meet those projections 100%. Um, I think things just happen between weather and um, crop performance. Um, but in general, you know, we're hitting those projections um, pretty closely to what we're, we're hoping for. And so then I can uh, project what that value would be of what I want to give them in that share. And that's all in the planning stage. But you can also uh, think about, well, what did I give out last year? Okay, so look at your past share contents and then calculate that market value that way in terms of getting an idea of how close did you keep the value of that share each week to what you charge them. Um, and so we do also keep those records as well. And then if you're looking for how to determine the market value, um, there's great resources at the Center for Crop Diversification. They have uh, farmer's market price reports that we'll talk about here in a second. Um, but there is another this concept of overage in the sense that if, it, if the CSA is really valuable, you want to make sure that they feel that they're getting their money's worth. And in some cases, maybe that they're getting a little bit extra by joining your farm. Um, this may not be the case for every farm that they want to offer an overage in the sense of it's more than they're paying for. Um, we do uh, have that mentality um, to a certain extent that we want them to feel that they are getting their money's worth and um, that that will be something that they see as a benefit of being at the CSA. It's a good value for the produce. Okay, so just as an example, uh, our case study for our farm, I'm just gonna take an example of our share values and kind of walk you through what that might look like for us. So this is an example from last year, um, the week one share and the week eight share. And so again, I look at 
what what those values are of those crops are, what I would charge for those uh, crops a la carte, and then I'm calculating that share value. So if you remember, I said we were charging uh, $37 a week for our share. So what you'll notice about the values here is they're not $37, right? So that's just kind of the nature of the fluctuation of a CSA. And I think you can explain that to members, you know, earlier in the season, it might be a little leaner as you're ramping things up and production is, is expanding. You're a little more limited maybe on the crops that are a, you're able to grow and maybe the crops you are able to grow in the spring, early summer, are just not as valuable as some of the crops that we would grow in the midsummer or late or early fall. Um, so again, we explain that to the customer up front that they know that maybe not every single week you're checking that box of I got what exactly what I paid for. They know there's going to be some variability in the season and that's just part of the CSA. So then you look at later in the summer, we hit big numbers here because uh, high value crops, right? So looking at week 15 and week 22, our last week, I always like to end our CSA on a high note. So I always want them to walk away feeling like, wow, <laughs> I got what I paid for and then some. I want them to feel really good about that CSA that last week. So we do sometimes uh, go a little overboard on that last week. But when you're getting you know, high dollar value items like tomatoes, um, sweet potatoes, it, it just shoots that, that price up uh, over the course of the week, right? So we look at this over the course of the entire season and um, our average last year was $43 a week. So that was definitely over 37, but I would say uh, it was only about, it was about 16%. I would think that 16% is more than what we would want. I kind of would shoot probably more for a 10 to 12% overage in terms of that value. But this is just showing you an example. That's where we ended up. And looking at those projections helps us decide like, hmm, maybe we need to either hone in our production, maybe uh, reduce a little bit of what we're providing, or maybe we need to increase the price. So these are kind of where those considerations can come in. Um, so here's just an example of the farmer's market price reports, which you can find at the Center for Crop Diversification. They'll show you the high and the low points for different crops at different markets in different counties. I find this really helpful if you're trying to think about um, how to price or value those individual items. So another thing I want to think about is this consideration of um, how and, and when to raise prices. Um, so we got to interact with a, another CSA grower from the UK named Ed Hammer, and he got a research project um, through the CSA, um, got a grant and through the CSA Innovation Network and Tim Woods at UK was able to connect and he visited our farm this spring. He also visited around uh, 20 to 30 other farms all across the US. Um, and I really think that that was um, wonderful getting to connect with him, having his experience and perspective as a farmer over in um, England. And then he kind of assimilated all this research and shared that recently with um, some of the farmers that he visited. And so one of the things he found was, um, you know, that in America, the food prices have increased with inflation, an average of 8.2% since 2015. So that's pretty substantial um, overall. And but we're not surprised by that, right? COVID inputs, things like that, we've seen that price increase. So when he interviewed these CSAs, most of them were saying, well, they were increasing prices two to three percent each year. Um, however, you know, one farm did cite that they actually use the U.S. Treasury fiscal report as their basis for price raises. And they explained that. Um, so one thing that I looked up before coming on tonight was the consumer price index. So if you look at the consumer price index, um, it's predicting that food prices in 2024 are going to increase by 2.5% over 2023. So again, if you're looking for some sort of benchmark of how you might raise it, um, this would be a way to do it. And I think this was a good suggestion and are really interesting to hear from Ed on that from talking to other CSA growers. Um, he did also talk about how interviewing CSA growers, there was this common thread about raising prices, that there was this felt indignity of having to justify your price increases with an apologetic narrative. Um, I don't know if you all have felt that, but I, I can resonate with that resonates with me in the sense that when you raise prices, there is this, uh, you know, fear, right, that this customer is going to get disgruntled or maybe, you know, go to another farm. And I think that's where knowing your customer base really well, having that relationship with the CSA is really critical. 
Um, if you have that relationship, I think you can explain it in a way, again, citing things like the inflation, um, citing things like raising wages for your staff, um, all those things that are important and valuable, the customers will understand. And uh, I think that we have to trust and have faith, faith in the customers in that sense. Um, and we don't need to necessarily be apologetic, I think. Um, but I think that's a, a really good point, that this is something that maybe some of us do struggle with. And then another example I just wanted to share, um, again, this is not our program, but um, Mustard Seed Farm in Ohio, um, they shared recently about how they offer sliding scale for their CSA, and they assimilated, uh, assembled this um, data for us. And so they showed that over nine years, um, by doing sliding scale payments where members elected uh, which income bracket they were in and how much they could pay, um, they self-selected that. And so they had different um, pay rates. Um, but over nine years, they actually brought in just as much, if not more money than um, they would if it had been a fixed price. So I think this, again, just another innovative way to think about pricing um, you know, as a way to reach more customers, to make it more accessible. I think this is going to be um, the future, really, of CSA pricing. And I think it's something to really consider um, for other farmers. It might work well for you and your customers as well. And it's encouraging for me to see this data, too. OK, so that's just kind of a, a just kind of a broad um, foundation as you think about um, who your customers are, what exactly they're going to value. And, and then also think about, um, you know, what it means to um, sign up for a CSA and how can you emphasize those intangible values so that, you know, they are, when you price it, the customer understands what is encompassing that price. And it's going to be more than just the market value. And I hope that the customers can understand that and that you can um, explain it in a way that um, is really attractive. And so that's something that we always focus on is really emphasizing um, why joining a CSA is so wonderful. Um, I just want to have one small caveat here too, that our farm is predominantly CSA. So 80, 90% of our income is CSA. We aren't as diversified as most farms um, because CSA is the market and the model that we're using for our education and our extension outreach. And so I think if you're at another farm that's more diversified, you might have a slightly different approach um, I'm looking forward to hearing from Bree because I know when you have many more markets, um, you got to think about that as well. And when you're doing things like customization, um, there may be other factors to consider. Um, for us, we don't really do customization. We don't use an online software. So it is kind of more of a traditional CSA. And so that kind of also influences our pricing philosophy and how we approach pricing. So I just want you all to be aware of that. Um, and when you think about costs of production, um, that is, of course, another consideration. And um, Katie mentioned that as well. So there's some economic resources out here, one from UK, um, our economic analysis that you can find online. Obviously, the Organic Farmers Business Handbook is another great resource. Um, but again, I want to say, um, if you're thinking solely about the cost of production, um, it may not be the deciding factor for you in the CSA. Um, for example, I know that, you know, maybe Brussels sprouts are not the most cost effective crop for us to grow, but there is a high expectation that in the fall, our CSA members are going to get Brussels sprouts. So again, maybe you still grow them, even if it is not the most cost effective crop for you to grow, because there is an expectation from your customer that they're going to get certain crops. Um, you could think about tweaking that. You could think about sourcing those from another farmer. If you can't grow them cost effectively, you could think about reducing the acreage. So maybe you still provide them, but it is um, just less acreage or less frequent or less quantity. So I think there'd be other ways and other angles to go about that when you think about cost of production, um, other than just it does not cost effective and then eliminating it. Um, certainly that could be a decision if your CSA members don't really necessarily aren't as invested in some of those crops that aren't as cost effective. But for us, we know that we're going to still grow Brussels sprouts, even if they aren't as cost effective for us. OK, I'm going to end there so that I can give Bree some time to share um, and then we'll do Q&A at the end as well. All right. I will jump right in and hi everybody. My name is Bree Pearsall and I'm with Rootbound Farm. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. 
Okay. Can you all see my screen? That Let's looks open. great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, really glad to be with you guys here uh, this evening. Uh, CSA is one of my favorite um, parts about getting to be a farmer um, in 2024. I love CSA. It's a big part of what we do um, on our farm. Um, my husband, Ben Abel, and I run Rootbound Farm. Uh, we're in Oldham County, which is right outside of Louisville. And CSA is um, the biggest part of what our farm does as well. It's our biggest um market outlet for our products. Uh, we grow certified organic veggies, eggs, um, lamb, and chicken for um, our CSA, as well as our uh, small wholesale and farmer's market. Uh, our CSA is about 800 members across um, Oldham County, Louisville, uh, Frankfurt, and Lexington. And we offer a 32-week CSA program. So we uh, begin at the beginning of May, and we go through Christmas. So uh, 32 weeks of CSA. Our goal is to um, offer year-round CSA, and each year we're inching more and more towards that goal as we add um, infrastructure and capacity and just um, the ability to grow food for a longer part of the calendar year. Uh, this is our ninth season doing community-supported agriculture with CSA. Uh, our first CSA year was 2015, and we started with 75 members. And um, we do have a customizable CSA, and we'll talk a little bit of, about what that means. We've been offering a customizable CSA for about five or five or six years, um, and then we had a more traditional CSA for the first uh, three years. Um, we deliver our product through. Um, a community pickup model. So we have about 20 to 25 different pickup locations across those um, regional areas I was talking about. And that ranges from, um, so we pack people's boxes and they pick them up at a location um, that is sometimes somebody's front porch in a neighborhood. Sometimes it's a community-based um, organization like a YMCA. And sometimes it's a local business, like a small grocery or a brewery or a yoga studio or something like that. Our average pickup uh, serves about 20 to 30 people uh, per location. We have some that are bigger than that and some that are smaller. All right. Um, so the topic of our presentation, uh, following right behind Christy, is pricing and valuation. And so two of the big questions I just wanted to pose for the group are, you know, how do CSA customers add value for the farm? So what sets them above all other customers and markets? Um, and then second, what are we providing to CSA members that adds value for them above and beyond what they could get from us at other retail markets? I think one of the burning questions that underlies a lot of pricing discussions about CSA is should they get a deal? Should the CSA member get a deal above and beyond the price of the CSA? And I think how uh, you answer these questions for your farm might help shed light on um, the value of the CSA. So some of the things that CSA customers provide for our farm for value that sets them above all other customers and markets are their consistency of purchases. So you know, if they're joining the CSA for up to 32 weeks, that's that's somebody who's spending money every week on your farm. And I don't I don't have any other customers at farmers markets or groceries or anywhere else that are purchasing from us consistently every week over that amount of time. Um, secondly, um, CSA members have a high diversity of purchases across the types of products that we grow. So we have some crops um, that obviously are very high value. Um, you know, we can grow kale and turn it around and sell it for a pretty high profit margin, but we are not selling uh, watermelon and strawberries at a very high profit margin on the farm. And CSA members are spending money across all of the products that we grow, which makes them a really valuable customer. Um, and then lastly, depending on how your payment uh, model is for your CSA, oftentimes CSA members are paying upfront 
um, you know, they're offering um, in many ways a zero percent loan to the farm by paying for their share up front, which is a very high value. The flip side of that is that we're also providing a lot of things to CSA members that are very high value. One is convenience. Um, you know, our I mentioned our CSA has a lot of different pickup locations where people can just get in and out on a Wednesday night and leave with a box of items that they chose for their week, which is a very high convenience compared to a more traditional way of purchasing our produce at a farmer's market, for example. Um, the farmer's market we participate in in Louisville is notorious for very long lines. You're not gonna get in and out of the farmer's market under 45 minutes to an hour if you're making purchases at, um, you know, for your weekly groceries. And the CSA just provides a really quick and easy way to get that product. So that's a huge value that we're providing to customers. Um, we also provide a lot of support around storage and recipes. You know, a lot of people want um, to push themselves to eat more vegetables, to eat more leafy greens, to eat things that are um, that they know or will improve their quality of life, but they might struggle to know how to prepare those items or how to store them. And in a weekly newsletter, we're providing a lot of support for people to be successful in incorporating this type of um, eating into their life. So that's a huge value that we also offer. So all that to say for us, um, the valuation of the CSA often ends up being about the retail price of what the CSA product is that the person is purchasing. So the value, that meaning the weekly value of the CSA is going to be about the sum of the value of the items that are in the box. So this next uh, slide shows, um, these are just screenshots from our website. These are our three different box sizes. Um, we offer a small, a medium, and a large box. Um, we, for the first several years, five years maybe, we only offered the full size, um, but we did begin offering the small share because we were hearing from customers um, over and over that it was too much food or that there was one or two people that wanted to in the household that wanted to participate. So we created the small share. Um, it is our most popular share size. Uh, we only offer weekly CSA. We don't have a biweekly option. Or, um, so when you sign up for your share size, it is a weekly commitment. Um, but like I said, that retail value, um, it looks a little differently for us across those share sizes. So for example, um, the full share is usually hitting about just at retail value of the items in the box. Um, the small share is typically a little under retail value for the items. And then the robust share, the large one, um, is usually um, the customer's getting a little more in their box than the retail um, value of the items. And that is because across these three share sizes, most of our overhead is the same, whether you're a small shareholder, a medium size or a large size. Um, the cost of the box to pack your share is the same. The cost of the staff time to manage you as a customer, to communicate, to um, take payments, um, to write the newsletters, to transport the products. The, most of the overhead of CSA is shared um, equally among different share sizes. So we do give people more value um, for uh, their purchase as the share size and value cost um, gets bigger. Okay. All right, so how do we know when we have the right value in the share? Um, I think nationally there's been a lot of research about what makes CSA members happy? Uh, Christy talked about that retention rate. You know, about half of people are trying CSA and deciding not to join again. And the number one reason that CSA members give for not rejoining a CSA is that it was too much food. So we really want to resist the urge to put more vegetables in the box than we really, our gut tells us as the farmer is the right amount. Um, 
you know, I, I don't want a member to say, I love the CSA. I was so happy, but I'm not joining again next year because it was too much food. Um, there's a lot there that we could dig into and to why people would say that it's too much food, but, um, I think we have to be careful um, about thinking we're adding value by adding product in the CSA. So I've heard of a lot of different um, methods that people use to value what goes in the box. One of the things I've heard is a number, telling people a certain number of items. You can always count on having 10 different items in your box. You can count on having eight different items in your box. Um, sometimes I'm asked by potential customers if there's a certain amount of weight that's guaranteed in the box each week. And then lastly, um, I know some CSAs use uh, measurements like using a peck size value or a bushel size box or something like that. Um, I think that uh, because CSA uh, requires so many different props over the course of the year, um, it can get tricky to value things by number of items uh, or weight, for example, um, particularly when you start getting into those really high value items like Christy was talking about. If you want to put, um, you know, in the in the spring, it's very easy to have an eight item share because you've got items like radishes and garlic scapes and green onions and things that are fairly low value. I mean, those are typically three dollar items at the at the farmer's market but as you move into times of the year where you want to put a nine dollar quart of strawberries in the box or two pounds of heirloom tomatoes which is is worth nine dollars as well then it can be hard to have a box that has eight to ten different types of vegetables because some of the items in the box are really high value so there may be weeks in which we have five items in a share um, for a small share. And then some weeks, the same, the same small share um, would have nine, eight items. So it just really depends for us on the value um, of the items. So um, I asked Katie to drop in the chat for me a couple of links in addition to the ones that Christy shared about the farmer's market pricing reports. Um, how we can look up what retail values are out there for crops. Um, there's two, one is, one of the resources I shared is just an Instacart link. Um, you can create an account for yourself and you can put in an, any zip code you want and you can look at pricing for individual items at Whole Foods. Whole Foods is the one I would recommend. Um, but then you can also look at uh, grocery stores like Kroger or Publix and how, uh, what the price is for, um, a pound of tomatoes at a, a store like that. But then also the Park Slope Co-op provides more detail and more similar type products to ones you might be growing on your farm where it specifies if the product is local and if it's organic. And that can kind of help you gauge what value your product should have over the cost of that product at Kroger. Um, we should, um, I, I know that I'm not trying to compete with Kroger on their pricing, but there have been so many times where I don't even know where to start on valuing um, an item that we're trying to introduce to the CSA. So um, lastly, I'll talk a little bit about customizable CSA, CSA shares and what that looks like on our farm. Uh, we work with a online software called Farmigo. Uh, there are many different softwares out there. Um, they're becoming more and more popular. Um, local line, Gray's card, you name it. There's all kinds. We've been with Farmigo um, for four years, five years, five years, I think. Um, and what it allows us to do is um, members, when they sign up for the CSA, they get an account. And every week we populate a store um, it really is similar to shopping like in an Amazon cart uh, for your CSA and each product it has a value assigned to it. Uh, we use credits. So we don't want really want our members just from a marketing perspective to see like dollar amounts floating around all over the place. We've, they've already paid for the CSA. So we kind of want to move on from dollars. And so we price everything in credits. Um, our small shares get a certain amount of credits each week, 20 credits. Our full shares get 30 credits. Our large shares get 40 credits. And then the items um, 
have a credit value attached to them. And then members can swap things in and out based on what they want. So, you know, if a small share customer is looking at, um, you know, two pounds of heirloom tomatoes costing eight credits, um, they can take one of those pounds of tomatoes out, spend four credits on that, and then use their other four credits to get an extra bunch of carrots or something like that. So it's fully among the different vegetables that we offer, it's fully customizable to, as far as limitations. Um, there's very few. Um, we do put limits on things like strawberries. Like we don't have enough for everybody to just drop all the veggies and fill the box with strawberries. So we can easily say limit strawberries to one pint per person or one quart per share or something like that. But for the most part, the members get to move items in and out of their cart. And then lastly, this is just a slide that shows our payment plans. I think this is another opportunity we have to really think about the value that CSA members are providing to the farm and how to uh, reward that value. So um, we do have a short commitment option. Um, the minimum commitment in the CSA is four weeks. So we do have members that join us for four weeks. And at the end of that four week period, they do not auto renew or they cancel their auto renewal. And so they've participated for only four weeks. And then we've got people that go all the way up to that 32 week. And so for our members that are participating for 32 weeks, we offer an incentive of 10% discount at the time of sign up. And that, um, that is a discount that a lot of people want. I mean, we have about half of our members that choose to pay in full for 32 weeks at the time of sign up. Um, they certainly um, could just choose to pay for four weeks at a time, but they're choosing to pay for a longer period, um, partly because I think they really understand and want to support the farm in that way. They understand the impact that that, ha that type of commitment has on the farm, but they also are incentivized um, by a discount on their share. And so there's different ways you can look at discounts. Um, you can take your actual cost and actually give them a discount, or you can take your actual cost and um, increase it by 10% for the people who don't choose that option. You know, So you really can capture um, your philosophy on how you want to approach discounts. But I do think offering different uh, payment plans or commitment links gives people the opportunity um, to get a value if they're willing to make the commitment that you you are desiring for them to make in the CSA. Um, I couldn't see any of the chat because I was sharing my screen, but I I think this is that's the end of my um, presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you. Have. Yeah, so we have a few questions. Thank you both so much. Um, so one of the things I know both of you, uh, both of your farms do some kind of event or a you pick or things like that. Um, how exactly do you value those into, you know, the cost of CSA? I know it, it might have a separate um, ticket sometimes, but sometimes that's just included as a CSA member. Um, just talk me through a little bit of that thought process. Yeah, I think that CSA member events are very important. Um, you know, the num when we've done surveys in the past of why people choose CSA, the number one reason why they say they choose CSA is they want to support a local farm. You know, it's not because we have the best vegetables. It's not because they want to eat healthier. It's because they want to support a, a local farm. That's the number one reason. And the best way for them to to deepen that connection and really to strengthen them as a long-term customer is to have people come to the farm. Um, we've done a lot of different types of events. Um, and I can say across all of our events, none of them make money as an event. Um, some of them lose a lot of money <laughs> and our goal is for them not to lose a lot of money anymore. But all that to say, um, we take it pretty seriously that the, the point of the event is to engage CSA members and potential CSA members. And so we, a lot of our events are free for CSA members and there's a charge for people that are in the general public. And that just helps us really 
spend the farm's uh, resources to put on those types of events on the people who are investing back in the farm through CSA. Yeah, Bethany, I'll just say um, we've done potlucks in the past, um, but there was a couple years where we were providing some food. So we were making pizzas or doing things on farm to provide food. And so we we haven't been doing that in the past like two years since COVID, but kind of pre-COVID, we were rolling in a dollar or a dollar or two to the share co costs and just telling people, hey, we're including this extra, you know, two dollars um, to cover uh, this potluck that is free for you to come, but it's just rolled into the share price for everybody so that we can provide the food. Um, but since then, we have kind of just stepped away from that. Um, it was just a little bit too much for us. So we are simply just making it a potluck and it is free. And we do encourage them to bring a friend. And that's just mostly for marketing, just to like expand people's uh, connection and, um, you know, more, more people who are getting on the farm or experiencing what it is to be a CSA member. And, and that to us is worth it rather than charging. That's great. Yeah, I've, I have heard that from a number of farms, CSA or not, that the events are sometimes um, more not as worth it as they thought it would be, because um, it, it really takes a lot of planning and a lot of money to host them. Um, someone had a question. They said, do you guys charge a fee if someone wants to pay with a credit card? And I'll shoot that over to Bree. Hey, Sharon. Um, we do not... Um... We do not charge a fee if they pay by credit card. This year, we did um, include in our sign-up language that we're asking people to consider using a bank draft at the time of sign-up instead of credit card. Um, and we said, this is our preferred method. It helps us um, save on overhead. Um, but most people are still choosing credit card, even though it, you know we're saying that. Um, you know, the, the, the flip side of that would be offering only check, but it's a very important part of our payment model to have auto renew for those shorter payment plans. So the three to percent, three to 4% uh, fee that we're paying on top of credit card is, is low compared to the potential loss that we would have by not being able to auto renew people if we let them like send us a check every four weeks, a lot of people would just drop off. Whereas the credit card allows us to um, really keep people engaged until the point of ha them having to opt out. So um, no, we don't, we don't have a fee on top of um, just the general sign of price. Um. Christy, I'll start with you on this question. Um, Bree had touched on, you know, competing or not competing with Kroger um, or Whole Foods or things like that. Um, you will, both of you have touched on, you know, all of the different ways that you can show value. But when it comes down to someone who's saying, well, I can get this tomato for, you know, $1.50 at Kroger, how do you show the value of your CSA? That's, I know, a very loaded question, but... How do you explain that to someone that is kind of just looking in black and white? Yeah, that's difficult. I mean, honestly, it's just, I encourage people to try it because I think there's it, a lot to be said for just the flavor of local and the diversity. Um, so if they're not sold for the flavor and the variety that they're getting, then I don't know that I can convince them. If they really are wanting a dollar fifty tomato, then go to Kroger. Um, yep. <laughs> but, you know, I think that just, just, just try, I mean, just embrace that they need to, like, let them try it or encourage them to try it. But if they're really, if price is the bottom line for a customer, they won't sign up for CSA. I think if price is really the biggest factor, they just won't. And that's not the customer you should be courting. Yeah. Sometimes just let them go. <laughs> Bree, do you have any points with that? Yeah, I would just add that CSA is a value-based purchase. And so, um, you know, maybe just spending some time really um, being sure with what your values are and why you farm and why you farm for, for CSA um, and really finding where the customer intersects with those values. And if there really aren't any intersections, it's probably not going to work out with that customer. But if there's somebody that 
is valuing um, community, local relationships, sustainable land use, um, healthy employment practices, if that's a value that your farm has, then um, I think people pretty um, easily can make the jump as to why um, they want to make a value-based purchase from your farm. Um, mm -hmm. Um, a question that came in, um, any suggestions for a small farmer doing a CSA in a small rural community? Just general tips slash also pricing tips in a small rural community. We'll start with Christy. Um, I do think pricing is going to uh, be affected by your community. So, you know, in the sense of knowing your customers and, and who is going to likely sign up. And so knowing what their thresholds might be for is going to be kind of critical. Um, I only, you know, I, that's my only thought there is that understanding what the, the products are at your local farmers markets and then understanding, um, you know, who the customers are that you're attracting. Um, and it may be adopting something like what Bree was suggesting of um, shorter signups so that you can have a shorter time period to sign up to try it and encourage that. That might be, a, I, I would think that would be a really ex interesting way to approach it to just sort of encourage them to sign up for a shorter commitment, but then, you know, they get the bug and they want to come back. And then um, one last question we have, unless anyone wants to send any in the chat. Um, Sharon said, great presentation to the two of you. Um, what is your biggest challenge with new members? Bree, we'll start with you. I think our biggest challenge with new members is actually um, them understanding like the rigor of the schedule of the CSA. So like when you sign up for that CSA pickup location at West Six Brewery on Wednesdays from four to eight, like we mean that, like that's when the box is going to be there and that's when you need to pick it up. And I think people are just used to there being a lot more flexibility with maybe they're used to Kroger grocery pickup or something where if you don't show up, they just like hold it on the shelf or don't even charge you for it eventually or something. But, um, you know, there's a rigor around the routine of CSA. And then there's also the same like timeline rigor around when you can log into your account to customize your share, for example, that's not something we can't take custom orders by email the day before the, the day of the CSA, you know, we have a window of time and you have to log in during that time. And so there's definitely some rigor and um, structure around the time, the weekly flow of the CSA. And I think for brand new members, that is the biggest thing that they need help really wrapping their their head around like what are the routines that they have to take on. Yeah, I, I will add to, um, I, I'm thinking about when Corinna Bench presented it, um, I think it was a couple of years ago, she has um, the My Digital Farmer podcast and um, she, she shared just that she really sees CSA members as um, kind of in this, um, period this like trial ramp up period of two to three years before they really get the hang of it um and i i like talking about that that you know year one you know you're not going to be an expert at it you actually have to adjust like brie was saying to the rigors of it and so letting them know giving them the freedom to you know not feel like they have to get it perfectly the first year um, in the sense of like using every single crop before, you know, maybe something goes bad in their fridge or something. I'm like, that's going to happen to everybody, you know, so just um, encouraging them through that so that they don't feel like a failure when something, you know, went bad in their fridge that they just, you know, you can explain. And um, I think just giving them tools as well. So one of the things that we always talk about is um, every item in your share may not be something you eat that week. Um, it's okay to freeze things. Um, and that's fairly easy to do if you give them some tips. So um, things like that are helpful so that they can think about the CSA share maybe being um, not just for that get that week, but it could be beyond the life of that week. Yes, yeah. And food waste is huge, um, especially I think with new CSA customers. So that's very helpful. Um, and then Last question, um, how far in advance do you tell customers what they will be getting 
Do you give a list of crops you are growing at the beginning of the season or just let, let customers know week by week? Christy, um, I know you all do the pictures of your shares, but do those go out before or after? Uh, the pictures are after, um, but we do a preview on Monday. So we will send out on our blog a preview on Mondays. And that was because the CSA members were requesting it. They wanted to be able to grocery shop. And uh, yeah, and so knowing what additional items they might want to get for that week. And so we would give them a preview and just let them know, hey, there could be changes. But that's mostly because we don't have a customizable one. We're not using a software platform so in order for them to anticipate that preview was really important. Um, and then yes, they um, can swap on site, which we do allow as well to give them a little bit of that flexibility each week. And then Bree, just Bree, do you wanna say what you <laughs> put in the chat? Yeah, ours works pretty much identically to Christie's a few days ahead of time. The difference is that when they get that email saying this is what is available, that also starts their day and a half period from 9 a.m. to noon the next day where they can log in and make changes to their box. And then after that window closes, their box is locked and it's, they get the farmer's choice box for the week, which is great, but it's just a non-customizable box that they didn't make any changes to. I think that is it for the questions. Um, if we happen to get any more, I'll be sure to email those over to you all. But thank you so much, Christy and Bree. Um, and thank you to Katie, who's still on the call. Um, I appreciate everyone for joining today. I know it is supposed to be a couple of nights of really, really uh, great weather. Um, so I appreciate everyone that was able to tune in. Uh, we're